ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الذي تسالون به والرحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار again we start by praising and glorifying allah we declare that there is none worthy of worship except allah the one without any partners and we declare that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is allah's final messenger to the entire humanity who has fulfilled his mission and he has delivered the trust to convey the message and all of us muslims non muslims mankind in general if we choose by the grace of allah we can turn back to the original teachings of islam and mend our lives accordingly and thus be upon the straight path which leads to paradise and paradise is real it is created it is waiting to receive her occupants so is hellfire real physical and waiting to receive her occupants let me start with a, a particular narration concerning umar ibn khattab radhiyallahu anhu he was once sitting in the company of some of his colleagues other sahaba and he asked them to wish for something so one of them volunteered and he said i wish this place were filled with gold so i could spend it for the sake of allah but umar radhiyallahu anhu repeated the question and said no wish again wish for something really precious more meaningful than that perhaps not just money so someone else spoke up and he said i wish it were filled with pearls ornaments jewels so i can spend them for the sake of allah and give them in charity so he said again no wish for something wish so they conceded and said we don't know tell us what we should wish for what would you have us wish what do you want us to desire and so umar said the alan who i wish this place were filled with men like abu ubaid ibn jarrah radiyallahu anhu like muad ibn jabal radiyallahu anhu like salim the freed slave of abu huraira hudayfa radiyallahu anhu and hudayfa ibn yaman radiyallahu anhu people people count the most they invaluable we can't attach a price to that we know for a fact every human life is precious for the life of a muslim dedicated to allah with the pure faith burning in his heart given to the cause of islam to effect truth and justice and to bring rally, relief to the suffering and then yearn to die in his path what value what price do you attach to that 
And we need men like that. And such men will never come from broken homes who cannot find solace and comfort or guidance because they are confused along with the rest of society. So every one of us have to think about what are we living in. We have to examine our lives. Socrates, he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And the Quran and Sunnah has taught us to reflect on Allah's revelation. To think about where have we come from? What are we doing? Where are you heading to? Where are you going? To what are you running to? People take recourse to philosophy, reaches upwards, becomes frustrated. Allah sends a revelation from up, from the heavens, and is clear, crystal clear, and has direct impact on our lives if we follow it. So we can sit and philosophize and wax proud of our intellectual efforts. In the, in the end, solutions, but look at the solutions we have been applying down the ages. We had our reformation, our enlightenment, all sorts of things, our romanticism period as well, and we are now looking for comfort through spirituality. In the end, there is a vacuum. There is something crying out for meaning. It's like things are very big and fanciful, but devoid of essence. We have to replace the mad rush to what we call progress and prosperity without as it were, a care or concern for the afterlife with what Allah says in the Qur'an that good deeds and evil deeds can never be equal never Lord Nazir spoke a few words, self-criticism and some of us might take exception to some of his self-criticism but can good deeds ever be equal to evil, wicked deeds? look at our actions, look at the way we behave Look at our contribution. And then contrast that with what we demand. And then take our full right. A bad society will always make doing bad easy. And if we are complaining about a decadent society, bad society, we have to ask, what have we done to impede that easiness with which we can fall headlong into evil or wickedness? How are we a barrier? As one particular scholar mentioned, this society is dying and we don't even know it. And it's dying because they've taken the very name of God as a swear word. If you say Jesus, it's a bad way to use that word. That was a Christian scholar saying that. Um, may I ask the brother not to use his mobile phone, please? I'm sorry to interrupt my speech in this manner, but there are signs all around saying we should not be using mobile phones in the lecture theatre. If a supernatural evil visited our world, what would they see? In the 20th century, they would find that the greatest of evil occurred not in primitive societies, primeval societies, but in modern times. The Holocaust. Where did it happen? In the heartland of Europe. And most Germans were not shocked. And that wasn't too far back. And a minuscule semblance of that took place in Bosnia. And it happens all around the world. So the point is, we are now trying to subscribe to a world of human rights and we think singing the tunes of human rights is going to solve our problem. But one particular scholar, Isaiah Berlin, he mentioned that this moral law that we talk about cannot be sustained except by remembering the horrors of what we have done to each other, namely the Holocaust. We are capable of doing inhuman barbarities upon each other and then justify it through rational intellect. Look at the world we live in. It is a globalized, difficult world, very confusing. And all of us are part of it, whether we like it or not. 
We might moan about jobs being outsourced to Bangalore, or perhaps to China, perhaps Kenya next. But that is the nature of the world today, globalization. And at the root of it all is money-making. To put it, very, put it very simply, it is money-making. 143 members of the WTO, only about 21 governments are permitted to draft the policy, of which only four actually write it. USA, Europe, Canada, and Jap Japan. It's all about controlling the Earth's resources for the few, and the gap between the rich and the poor is ever widening, all around, in Britain, in America, and of course in third world countries. Hundred million dollars every day are being paid back by the poor countries to the rich countries in debt repayment. And we talk about debt cancelling and raising funds on fund days. The poorest of the poor, dying in the dirt, they are the ones who are keeping us in our living standards that we enjoy. And you and I are part of that society. And don't say cafe society. Most Arab countries, Muslim countries, are falling over each other trying to be part of that society. Winner takes all. So what we need, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to quote something from legend. What we need is something that makes us truly be counted. Because we mean something people can look up to. People of substance and metal. Arthurian legend. And this was actually um, exemplified in a film called Dragonheart. An old kind of, uh, the old code, the knight's code. And what was that? I want to mention that because in olden times, these kind of things stirred the hearts and memories of people. And I will challenge you that you will find every one of those words come true in the heart of a mujahid. Someone who truly wants to perform jihad fi sabilillah. A knight is sworn to valor. His heart only knows virtue. His blade defends the helpless. His word speaks only the truth. His wrath undoes the wicked. You can find ayat and hadith supporting each and every one of those characteristics. Roll them into one. That is the mujahid. We need mujahidun. We need honor. And that's what we are lacking. When this noble laureate from Nigeria did a series of talks on Radio 4, he discussed why the Palestinians are taking recourse to suicide bombing. Leaving aside the discussion, is it permitted or not? Is it good or bad? Why though? Why should any person take up that sort of a technique or strategy or tactic? Why? He said because human beings are not given dignity. When people are denied dignity, they will go to any lengths to get it for themselves. We today ourselves are denying our own dignity that comes to us due to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you and me to Islam, gave us the Quran and the Sunnah, taught us the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us the admiration of the Sahaba, taught us the truth about how to be a noble, upright person, dedicated to the service of Allah and serving the community. And look at our situation, how we are beggars and scroungers and mourners, and then people sometimes of violence, wanton destruction. So, O oh, you who believe, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu alaykum anfusakum. O you who believe, you have to take charge of your own souls. You must take control over your own lives. Be honorable. Shakespeare, he said, if it be a sin to covet honor, then I am the most offending soul. William Shakespeare. Even he had an understanding for the need of honor. Here we are Muslims. Honor comes from Allah. And he mentions to the angels in the first heaven, highest heaven. Then he asks the angels to pass it down and it comes down to earth. Honor comes from Allah through Islam. Special honor. 
Not the honor common to every human being, the honor of being a Muslim, and look at our undignified behavior. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he addressed the people and he said, when quoting this ayah, O you who believe, you have to take charge of your own souls. Few hours cannot injure you if you are rightly guided. He said, when people witness evil and they don't attempt to change it, they bring themselves close to the point where Allah includes them amongst those punished for that evil. So don't wash your hands clean and say, well, these are the misguided people, faithless people, godless people, infidels. No. It's our society, our country, we live in it, we take advantage of all the rights and perks, we demand, we have to give. And we have the best thing to give, Islam. And that wasn't just a statement on a piece of paper, here you go, believe in one God. It was meant to be a way of life in submission to Allah. Where is that? In all the departments of life that we face. The Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah does not punish the individuals for the sins of the community until they see the evil spreading amongst themselves. And while they have the power to stop it, they don't. All sorts of problems in this country. You talk about child poverty, or you talk about drug dealing. You talk about binge drinking, whether amongst the girls, or underage drinking. Or violence outside the pubs. Don't tell me it's not a Muslim problem because we don't drink. One particular convert or revert said to me, after he became Muslim, do you remember, he said, do, do you know, once before I was a Muslim, I was in the pub and there was this Pakistani gentleman with his girlfriend and he was telling me why I should believe in God. He was having orange juice but in the pub with his girlfriend. This is how confused we are. And we think we're doing okay because I spoke to him about God, didn't I? that kind of attitude. Every single thing that's going wrong in this country, if the Muslims had a say, they should have said it. At least, because ad-deenu nasiha, even to the common people, ordinary people. When the government asks for an input, a discussion or a white paper, if we had some information knowledge, we should have offered it. We should offer it. Take it or leave it, because we are Muslims. If we see things crumbling and going down the drain and making things worse, we should say so. Don't take that path, that's bad for all of us. Don't be like that people, I remember reading a book back in the 80s, it was called Jihad the Ground Plan. Some of my colleagues from the past may remember this book, Jihad the Ground Plan. And this was in the 80s, early 80s. And the book was saying one of the best way to bring, back, bring down the capitalistic Tyrannical society is to blow up the stock exchanges. Blow them up. Bring on the banking system and you watch the fun. What fun? All of us will suffer. Islamic responsibility teaches us that if you're going to take an evil away, replace it with something better, not something worse. You blow up the banks and the stock exchanges, what have you got now? A peaceful, harmonious Islamic society? And Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have been ordered by Allah to dispense justice between you. So don't be like these people in the olden days, misguided people. They could not burn heresies. They had to burn the heretics. Don't be like that. Some of us are thinking in those, type, those kind of terms. We see evil, we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Or look at the dua, the supplication of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because his supplication exemplifies and typifies what is in his heart that he ardently desires from Allah. It's very personal. Every dua, supplication, very personal, and he's crying out from within his soul to Allah, saying, "What? Oh Allah, set right my religion, make my deen straight, which is the basis of my affairs. Set right my world." which is my subsistence. If you don't like the country in which you live and you don't want to improve it, don't live in it and moan and still enjoy it. You have no respect. You can get out. It 
set right my world, which is my subsistence. If the river in front of my house is dirty, I want it clean so I can drink clean water. I don't moan about the water being dirty and, and, and spite it and still drink it. Set right my hereafter to which I shall return. Make my life the source of abundance in every good and make death a comfort for me from every evil. That is how we seek relief. We want Allah to be with us at all times, so we are always a positive contribution to wherever we are, like a good tree bringing its fruit at all seasons, bidni rabbiha, by the permission of its Lord, Surah Ibrahim. And when we are like that, seeking courage and valor and steadfastness upon the truth and sacrificing, building our homes like that, then inshallah, when that person then undertakes the jihad with a sword, he will be admired. The British spirit will admire it. The BBC kind of survey or census they had done on the top most English or British person. Who was that? Winston Churchill came out on top. Let me quote you something from him. He said, it is the primary right of men to die and kill for the land they live in. Primary right. And to punish with exceptional severity all members in their own race who have warmed their hands at the invader's hearth. You will admire the spirit of the Palestinians and the Iraqi resistance. But people have to be of true valor and honor. Talking about King Arthur, Arthur Winston Churchill says, and whenever men are fighting against barbar barbarism, tyranny, and massacre for freedom, law, and honor, let them remember, remember that the fame of their deeds, even though they themselves be exterminated, may perhaps be celebrated as long as the world turns around. You'll become immortalized through your sacrifices. You won't be called terrorists. You would have died for the service of humanity with the faith of God burning in your heart. So we need to learn revealed knowledge. We have to become acquainted with Allah's revelation. And using that as the foundation and the basis, the backbone, the grid, we have to acquire discovered knowledge. That's why you have those two topics in the conference. Something to tie us down to a standard, gives a stable platform more than a footstool, a proper platform. And on that stable ground you stand, and we did learn everything around us. Political systems, current affairs, economics, art, culture, everything. And see how we contribute with the fire of our tawheed in our hearts. Requires intelligent study and arduous study. Can be done by imported people who haven't read a single book in English. We can only speak in terms of some village dialect from back home somewhere. Anas ibn Malik reports anhu, that after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Abu Bakr anhu, said to Umar, anhu, let's go and visit Umu Ayman. Anha. Nice thing to do, let's go and visit, call upon her. And when they went to see her, she began to weep. She is crying. So two aged, senior, old companions, grown-up adults. She's, they went to visit this old lady and she's crying. And they thought perhaps she's crying because she's missing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because people truly loved him, missed him. They tried to comfort him, com comfort her and say, well, don't you know, he's in a far, far better place. He's not suffering. He is in deep luxury, comfort. Don't be sad. He's in a better place. What is she saying? I know that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was mortal. He wasn't going to live forever. Human being, the best. I know that he was going to leave us sometime. But I cry because revelation has ceased to come from above. And that's the shift in attitude we need to bring. Too many personality politics going on, too much of that. 
my shaykh against your shaykh, my brand of Islam against your brand of Islam. Revelation itself, look at what the Quran and Sunnah teaches us, how to bring, bring up people and miss it. That stupendous, cataclysmic occasion of revelation. Allah Almighty spoke and His words came down. Never again will this happen. And those words are preserved in the Kitab, the Sunnah. So honesty, as the Hadith says, was first sent down upon the hearts of people. And then they learned Iman from the revelation. Then they learned the do's and don'ts regulations. We need to become honest. Honestly admit where we are today, where we are heading, and how badly we are doing with Allah's revelation. We shout, and we froth at the mouth, and we run about helter-skelter, demanding and calling and shouting for Islam. Where is that dedicated, calm, and confident attention to living Islam? Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the meaning in English, the case of a believer is beautiful, it's amazing, it's wonderful. Take pride from that, a humbling pride, not arrogance. Our situation is wonderful. All the confusion, all the suffering, all the people going astray, we don't enjoy seeing that happen. But still, we enjoy being Muslims. Because whether I can change things or not, at least I have the comfort of knowing and my situation, if I can retain faith and live by it, is something truly amazing because Muhammad said so, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because there is good for him in everything. And it is not so for anyone else except the believer. If he experiences something pleasant, he is grateful to Allah. And, if, and that is good for him. And if he comes across something unpleasant, he is patient, still grateful. And that is good for him. So let's not be a nation of moaners. And let's not just cry and give up. Do what needs to be done. Pass or fail. At least we can say to Allah, Oh Allah, we tried. We attempted to do so. But where is that program? Where is that unity required amongst us? The seriousness of purpose to do that the proper way. It's all random. It's all ad hoc. We moan about how the Orientalists and the missionaries and all these people spend so much of their budgets trying to destabilize Islam and the Muslims and so forth, at least give them credit. They spend very many long hours studying with great scholarship about Islam. Look at some of the missionary training schools to the degree they go to learn Islam. To subvert maybe, but look at how much they spend. Now look at our efforts. Just falling short of raising invectives. So when we have knowledge of Islam, we are careful about the truth, inshallah ta'ala. We have a certain type of pleasure that gives us the calmness and the serenity that is needed to carry on in life with that definite purpose and aim. To live for Allah, to die for Allah. Abu Hanifa said, Rahmatullah if the kings knew the pleasure we are in, they would send their armies with swords to take it away from us. What pleasure? What pleasure is talking about? Good food? Palaces? If the kings knew the pleasure we live in, the contentment, being at ease, comfortable, do what you like, to know who we are, to whom we belong, to where we are going to, to know that. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go everywhere for da'wah, gatherings, fairs, you know, any kind of a meetings, marketplaces. He would go and follow them even to their houses to summon them, to call them, to invite them to Allah. And his uncle perhaps would follow and oppose him. Do we have opposition like that? Do you have your uncle, your grandfather, your brother saying don't listen to him, he's a madman? That's more pernicious. And somebody alien saying, well, don't listen to him, he's a bad guy. Your own relative, your own senior member of your family saying, don't listen to him. And Abu Bakr, anhu, he came and he said to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is it true what the Quraysh are saying, O Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about you saying that we should abandon our gods? 
They understood. Whether, whether they accepted the deen, the message or not, they knew what the message was about. It does really mean abandoning false gods. Do you even know what are the false gods in our present time? If I say, like the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi to Ali radiallahu, give up Allah al Uzza. Do I know how to say that to a kid today, a 10 year old boy? Because Allah al Uzza means nothing to a 10 year old boy, not nothing to us even. Do we know how to translate them into modern day gods? What are those things? Do we dare to say them? Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes indeed, I am the messenger of Allah and his prophet. He sent me to deliver his message and to invite you to Allah by the truth. For I swear Allah is the truth. I call you, Ya Abu Bakr, believe in Allah alone, in him who has no associate. Must be clear cut, focused, not diluted the way we dilute it. Abu Bakr became a Muslim, radiallahu so he had a lot of companions. And they brought with them skills. Abu Bakr was a master genealogist. He was a historian. People used to depend on him for historical information. He was a great tradesman. He was an honest, charitable person. But he was known for those skills. And so he who is good in Jahiliyyah is good in Islam, provided his understanding. What skills are we bringing to our community as Muslims? Must ask. We moan about not having people like Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. They brought skills and refined them with Islam and put that back into society. What are our skills that we're inputting into British society? I have to ask. This is where we live. Charity begins at home and we are going to be asked about our neighbors. Muslims and non-Muslims, they have equal rights and equal treatment in the deen. When I die, the first thing I expect to be asked regarding social responsibility is not about what had you done for Kashmir and Burma? What had you done in Ipswich? That's where you lived. You died there. In Suffolk. And that has nothing to do with nationalism. Don't confuse it. I'm not nationalistic. I'm part of the Ummah. Of course we are. Abu Hurairah to said, learn from a genealogist what will enable you to join the ties of kinship. So this is a discovered knowledge. Then desist, know your limit. Learn from Arabic what will help you to understand the book of Allah. Then stop. Don't get carried away. Know the limits. Everything must serve a practical purpose. What are the knowledge, branches of knowledge we need to acquire or master? in Britain to do da'wah fi sabilillah. Don't you think we need to know a little bit about history or culture? You don't think so? If I was now transported to the Greenland or Iceland and talking to the Eskimos, do you think I'll talk to them the way I talk to people back in Bangladesh village? Same things will apply? No. Somewhere down the line we lost the plot. We're too busy with ourselves. In acting as like little dramas and plays, you know, back home thing. We forgot. We thought just giving speeches and holding exhibitions was all about dawa. There should be serious study, social sciences, psychology, all sorts of things, anthropology. All of them are needed. Three quarters of the British public spend their time more in, a, in the pubs, in the evenings. In the pubs, they overcome all the social barriers and stuff and do the bonding required. Many of the etiquettes are different in the pub than in the workplaces. Of course, we are not going to go to the pub, inshallah never. But we will have to replace that inability to go to pubs with something else. How else are we going to make contact? Waiting for them to come to our houses, we won't open the doors of our houses. So how is Dawa going to take place? So much to learn, so much to understand about the culture and the country of the people amongst whom we live and of whom we are part of. So much. So much has been neglected, left aside. Even Omar said, learn about women. 
whom you can marry, whom you can't marry, desist. Nothing is taboo. Learn. But provided we have a thorough grounding on the aqeedah of Islam. We know about Allah, we know about what He says, what He likes, what He dislikes. And with that knowledge of At-Tawheed, learn. Learn anything. So many of the psychologists of today, they say that most people nowadays, they spend their time doing two things. It's remarkably close to what Ibn Qayyim once mentioned. That people are always trying to run away from discomfort and come towards pleasure. And that's what the modern day psychologists spoke about as well. Most of people, most mankind, spend their time running away from pain and seeking comfort, enjoyment. Imagine people are doing that without a foundation on morality, based upon a true concept of Allah, accountability to Him, and a dread of a hereafter where you're perhaps punished eternally, or a desire to be in a hereafter where you are rewarded eternally. Imagine how selfishness and greed and all those kind of baser qualities will promote itself. So remember, the Messenger of Allah, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Antum Shuhadaullahi Fil Ard. You are the witnesses of Allah on earth. Look at our witnesses of Allah on earth, the lives we lead, the desires we have, the ambitions we harbor, the way we pursue our careers. You are the witnesses of Allah on earth. Shuhadaullahi Fil Sama. And the angels are the witnesses of Allah in the skies. They are doing their job fine. What sort of a job are we doing? So what we need to do is to very closely examine our hearts. Very deeply, I take a long look at our own hearts. Become a little bit introspective, a little bit. We need to think about ourselves. All this running around trying to call people to Islam and to God and so forth. Sometimes we miss the point. I was supposed to call myself to Allah first and foremost. I was supposed to be the one responsible for my own actions before worrying about other people. Everything is unfortunately seen in a black and white context and they are not. That's the way things are. One of the social, social scientists name was Levi Strauss, a Jewish guy, yes, no problem. Levi Strauss. He says so, and he's a master uh, social scientist. Human mind, it likes to think in terms of opposites. Black, white, day, night, red, white, whatever. People are like that. What do they see? When Lord Naziz says there are Muslim, there's a Muslim prison population far exceeding the percentage of the population of a country. How do you imagine the people are going to perceive us? Oh, no, no, but they have a wonderful book. They say so. They hold conferences and they talk about how wonderful their book is. Look at their behavior. That's how people like to think. Oh, propaganda is because the media is giving us a bad name all the time. Okay. You can't change it. The media. We can change the perception by, by counteracting the media, by doing what needs to be done as Muslims. Where is, what are those actions? In the end, people may even beat us up. It happened to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All he did was from the most sincere desire from his heart, called people to their salvation. And he had nothing to ask for in return. He didn't want anything. He went through the utmost difficulties to do the bidding of Allah so that we can find our way back to him and have happiness in this life and the next. And yet people beat him up and sought to assassinate him and make him bleed. And after the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud, he was injured. His tooth was broken and his face was bleeding, his head was cracked. And he said, how will these people who have wounded their prophet and broken his tooth attain salvation? While he only called them to Allah, what for what crime? Did he want their destruction? No. Did he want them to perish or to suffer or to become unsuccessful or to have a difficult time? No. 
He wanted the very best for them. And they made him bleed. So he uttered, after being made to bleed, he uttered, How will these people who have wounded their prophet and broken his tooth attain salvation? When all that he did was to call them to Allah. And straight away revelation came. And that's very instructive for us. Sometimes we like to practice tit for tat. Well, they did it to us, we do it to them. It's like an example I always like to give because it's stuck in my mind from Luton going for about seven, eight years. When some brothers were responsible for, um, well, I found out, um, doing a credit card scam, stealing credit cards and stuff. Well, in the colonial times, they took from us, we're taking back from them. Subhanallah lazim. And you are worshipping Allah, God. You think you can come near to Allah by practicing corruption and stealing. Revelation came straight away. Not for you is the decision. Not for you, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the decision. Whether he turns in mercy to them or punishes them. Indeed, they are the wrongdoers. But it's not your decision. How will they attain salvation? Perhaps they're all going to go to heaven later on. You don't know. Allah will guide them. You do your job. And we haven't even experienced a fraction of the suffering of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We pretend as if we have. You like to talk like that, but we haven't. There's something about history I want to mention very quickly because um, history is much um, ignored. And, uh, and then one more thing after that I'll finish inshallah. History is very important because the whole of culture, how, uh, how people are in a country, identity, is based upon two or three things. Language, culture, and more, both of them are combined in history. We have to know the history of our people, our country. And that may sound sometimes like a sellout to some people. But I'm not British, I'm a Muslim. Well, I'm not Pakistani either, I'm a Muslim. I'm not Egyptian, I'm a Muslim. Why do you have a problem with saying you're, not a, you're a Pakistani? You don't have a problem saying you're a Pakistani, yet you have a problem saying you're a British. Why? My children, my grandchildren being born in this country, never set foot outside this country, what are they? What are they going to go to? You can dream about going back to Pakistan because your grandfather came from there, you still maintain links. And we talk about Hijrah. Fine, don't live amongst the kuffar. Many people will do. And even if they are all going to get out, until they do, you still have to worship Allah and do what is right. You can't say, I'm leaving tomorrow, so today I will steal. I'm not going to make my home here. I'm going after six months. So for the next six months, I'm just going to rob and steal and pillage and rape. We still have to live up to Islam and be honest and courteous and be charitable and advise and then leave. Leave or not leave. History is very important. The social construction of knowledge is very important. And one thing that the uh, Anglo-Saxon historians always talk about and conclude is this point. J. A. Froud, let me quote him, he said that one lesson and only one history may be said to repeat with distinctness is that the world is built somehow on moral foundations. That in the long run, it is well with the good. In the long run, it is ill with the wicked. And that's the conclusion of the Venerable Bede and other Anglo-Saxon historians as well. In 18th century England, even in medieval England, history was fundamental to the culture of the people. It's all vanishing and evaporating like water under the baking sun. And we are asked now to have an identity consciousness. There was a survey done last year in British schools to Caucasian people, white, Anglo-Saxon, English, non-Muslim students, pupils. 70% of them knew nothing about being British. Couldn't care less. Yet we are the ones now having to identify ourselves with Britishness. So really, as Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَاعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ 
wa amila salihan wa qala innani min al muslimin who is better in speech than the one who calls people to allah do this job properly do this job properly as a muslim we cannot do this job properly by being confused and moaning and griping and not taking responsibility into our own hands while there is opportunity there is scope or allowance for us to get involved do so before it is the doors are closed there are some people i hear now moan and say it was okay in the past to go to jihad or trading wasn't it how come they allowed it then they don't allow it now well they don't what if, for whatever reason they did they don't anymore and they're regretting it as well robert cooper's book latest from the breaking of nations he talks about it how it happens don't know must never be allowed to happen again you should read Robert Cooper's book because uh, he talks about how many things about how to actually uh, bring about the um, you know the, the victory in the war against terrorism. And our Prime Minister, of course, listens to him a lot, Tony Blair. And Robert Cooper is actually a colleague of um, somebody called Kagan. I've read his book. I forgot his name. Paradise and Power. You read those two books things will become very clear. Why is America behaving the way it does? And why do Tony Blair toe the line that he does? What is going on? But down the line somewhere, it is about identity. We have to redefine identity for people. And what has Allah named you and I? Muslims. Problem is, we try to be Muslims from an ethnic, ethnic point of view. And we are shying away from Britishness. Be a Muslim. You'll be the best of British then. The last thing I would like to say is about male and female. That whatever we talk about in the end, the emphasis seems to be on breaking up homes and giving a lot of freedom for partners to choose their lifestyles. And marriage is no longer seen as a a, a, a sacred institution and there are debates about whether you know we should actually uh, legalize marriages between homosexuals and of course laws are being passed to that effect as well things are breaking up all over the place and it, it is more wrong to use the word sodomy than the actual practice itself this is our society you know, if you use the word sodomy, my God, you know, how, how uncouth can you be? How backward, you know? How could you use such a word? Hate mongering, hate speech. Practice is fine. The word is more hated. That is how much moral values have gone topsy-turvy. Muhammad told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most perfect in faith amongst the believers are those who possess the best way of life, the morals. And the best amongst you are those who are kindest to their wives. We really want to have, inshallah, the best of homes in any community. So others can look up and take an example from us at least. While we enjoy the quality of life, being happily married, home. Divorce rates are going up not only amongst the non-believers, amongst the Muslims as well. And in my own personal experience, however limited that might be, divorce rate is very high amongst precisely those Muslims who claim to be following the pure way of the Salaf. That's a fact. Don't hate me for saying it. That's a fact I have experienced. I hope your experience is different. Family, I would like to read you a passage about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From one of the uh, scholars, he said, It is important to look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad. No one faced greater tribulation. He lived to see all his children die in his lifetime, except Fatima. How many people experienced that in their lifetime? All his children. Out of six children, he saw five of them perish. His father died before his birth. His mother died while he was just a boy, six years old. His guardian grandfather then died, whom he loved. When he received his calling, he saw his people turn against him with vehemence and brutality. 
People who had once honored him now slandered him, calling him madman, liar, sorcerer. They stalked him and threw stones at him until he bled. They boycotted him and composed stinging invectives against him. He lost his closest friends and relatives like Hamza who was killed on the battlefield. His beloved wife Khadija of 25 years of blissful marriage died during the Prophet's most difficult moment. Abu Talib, his protecting uncle, also died. The Prophet was the target of 13 assassination attempts. How many people faced all that? And look at his family life as a father, as a husband. And look at all the hadith that we have on family. This is the proof of the guidance of Allah. With such a broken home, such a sad upbringing, He could bring about such a successful married institution. And here we are spoiling it all for ourselves, not knowing where to get, take guidance from. There is somebody called Gustave Le Bon in the 20th century. He wrote that it is so obvious that no one can contest it for a minute. What? That females are inferior to men. 20th century. You say that today, you will booed out of the hall. Not case perhaps. This was serious talk in the past, only about a hundred years ago. There's another uh, leading psychologist, his name is Simon Baron Cohen. And he confirms that most of us had always suspected that the female brain is different from the male brain. There's a physical difference between the two brains. Even in a one day old baby, there are predispositions to be tested and verified through experiments that show the male is not like the female. Much of our problems, societal problems are coming about because we are trying to blur that distinction and make them female to be like male and vice versa. And you'll find a whole body, a plethora or body of hadith talking about how we honor both the sexes with equal rights and equal rewards but different roles. He talks about how the male brain has certain advantages like using, make, using and making tools, hunting, tracking, trading, social dominance, tolerating uh, isolation, all sorts of things. While the female brain have the predisposition or excel in making friends, mothering, gossip, social mobility and reading your partner. It's a serious study. It's, it's book just went, came out last year. And it was actually promoted on Radio 4. Very interesting read. But the point is this, that people are now recognizing there is a difference, biological difference, not only because they can have babies, we can't, even how the brain functions, and they're complementary. None of this proves one is inferior to the other in intelligence, and Islam never says that. But they have roles to fulfill, mother, father, partners. He has created the pairs, male and female. We need to understand this very, very closely in our hearts. For Muslims who want to be families, male and female are not the same. It's not about upbringing. Because if I had allowed my son to play with dolls when he was a baby, he might have grown up to be a little bit effeminate. No. If I had allowed my little daughter to play with guns, perhaps. No, they naturally don't want to play with guns, the little girls. They naturally don't want to play with dolls, my little boy. Somehow. Why? Something in there. It's not social conditioning. Allah says, whoever works righteousness, whether male or female, while he or she is a true believer, indeed to him we will give a good life. Hayat and tayyibah. Whoever does righteous, good deeds, male or female, true believer, such will enter paradise. And not, not the least injustice, even to the size of a speck on the back of a date stone, will be done to him. No injustice, equal reward, equal dignity, equal honor, but they are complementary. Revive that, the Quran and Sunnah, and let society feel the warmth and the enjoyment of that relationship. In Allah's design, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَى They are not the same. Male is not like the female. The greatest tragedy that's befalling us is that, dis that, that distinction being blurred. So I'll finish with that. The last thing I would like to mention is just one hadith. I'll finish with that. 
and one ayah inshallah so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned all that we need to know through the Quran and the Sunnah and with those principles and values and norms in our lives we can go out reach out accommodate tolerate and live our lives to the full as devout worshippers of Allah in any context in any situation it is our ignorance that makes us to sometimes fear what is around us and not reach out and accommodate because we don't have that knowledge to do so we just want to be comfortable in our little cubby holes the little ignorance and little amount of knowledge that we have true knowledge would make us inshallah a full participant in the society so what was I going to say I was going to read you this um, this um, hadith sorry this, this ayah it says in the meaning in English and do not wish for the things in which Allah has made some of you to excel others for men there is reward for what they have earned and likewise for women there is reward for what they have earned and ask Allah of his bounty surely Allah is all-knowing of everything so once somebody um, Umm Salama radiallahu anha she asked the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said O oh, Prophet of Allah why is it that men have the privilege of performing jihad but women don't also why do we inherit only half of what they inherit and then this revelation came and wish not for the things in which Allah has made some of you to excel that's when this ayah came this shows to us how we must not try to do away with the natural separation or distinctiveness that has been bestowed on us by Allah the Creator to do that is futile, is damaging, is harmful in the shorter or long term don't be artificial, be natural with that naturalness we can make a lot of progress at tabari he made comments on this ayah, he says by this Allah means do not wish for the things in which Allah has made some of you better than others in terms of male and female separation and the last ayah was about this one where, uh, just to remind us that many people actually, actually are going to be tried and tested we had the problem with identity regarding the Welsh people a lot of historical information there that we need to understand how they were abused or restricted and then later on they were allowed certain rights and to speak the language or to own property and so forth all about the battles and things read it it's interesting at least but even more clear read about the persecution on the Catholics starting with the Reformation the dissolution of the monasteries and then what happened later on up to only 150 years ago the Gordon riots and everything that took place cold-blooded you know they murdered 300 odd Catholics in the streets how why why now perhaps it's our turn. Maybe it won't be like the Holocaust. May Allah protect. They might be like the Gordon Riots. And the worst thing that can happen is if something like that takes place, we then, then take it out upon the innocent. Which some Muslims talk about. Pure ignorance. Pure ignorance. Nothing to do with worship of Allah, seeking repentance and trying to strive to come nearer to Him. Strive in his cause, wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi. Strive in his cause that you ought to strive. True jihad, do that. What is appropriate, right, correct, just, according to Islam, virtuous, not through crime. He has chosen you, has imposed no difficulties on you in your religion. It is the way of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Abraham, peace be on him. It is he who has named you Muslims. We are Muslims. We are born here, we are bred here, we are growing up here, we are British. But we are worshippers of Allah. And my Britishness is going to be defined by my creed in Allah. Don't try to force me into becoming a Pakistani, because I'm not one of those. It is he who has named you Muslims, both before and in this revelation that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam may be a witness for you and you be witnesses to mankind witnesses to mankind so establish regular prayer give regular charity hold fast to Allah he is your protector the best to protect and the best to help may Allah forgive me and forgive you may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us only the benefit of this talk May Allah protect us all from the mistakes I have made, anything wrong, imbalanced, unjust I have spoken. 
I ask Allah to protect our hearts and minds from anything wrong, futile I have said, which is not true. May Allah only retain the truth in our hearts and grant us success in this life and the hereafter. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all the Muslimun, past, present and future, to unite us upon the truth in His true worship and to unite us in the best of paradise, Al Jannat al Firdos Ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiratu bi laika wa jazakumullah khairan. We'll start again after about five minutes. Take a little comfort break and then we'll have a presentation by certain members of our community, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan.